we have got an inordinate amount of teams that are still in what you would call quote unquote contention. Now, we have not done a playoff segment yet on this show since the season started, and I would not qualify this as a playoff segment. But I do want to take a look at some contenders out there, some teams that are undefeated. Maybe you got one loss, but you're still in what we would call that playoff picture. But really, I'm looking at conference championship pictures because this year, if you're in that, by default, you're probably in the college football playoff picture. There is no undefeated, well, there is no unbeatable team out there. Even Georgia, there is no unbeatable team out there right now. Even Michigan, even any of these undefeated teams. There are vulnerabilities. A lot of the teams we're about to talk about have a lot more strengths than vulnerability. So I want you to understand something. On this show, when we talk about the Tier 1 and Tier 2 teams, we don't waste time praising them. Everyone knows Georgia's got a really, really good defense, okay? Everyone knows that Oklahoma's got a really, really good quarterback room. We're not wasting time with that. you got to understand it's a privilege to be in this conversation. If you're not, that means you're not doing enough on the field. But once you get into this conversation, we start to pick you apart with a little more fine tooth of comb. And so it's going to sound like it's more critical. That's because it is, but that's only because we've, we've switched the microscope. You know how you go up strength a couple of, couple of notches? That's what we're doing to these teams. Where are the potential vulnerabilities? Let's start with Georgia. Preface, I think Georgia is number one in the country right now. The AP's got them there. The JP polls got them there. That is the backdrop with which all of this perceived negativity is about to be hurled at Georgia. Because it's almost impossible right now, trust me, I am a longtime resident of the state of Georgia, to have a properly contextualized conversation about the potential vulnerabilities of Georgia without someone screaming in your face. However, I'm going to do it anyway. Stetson Bennett is the biggest vulnerability here. It's been a very popular talking point over the last couple of weeks to say, especially in my home state, Stetson Bennett gives them the best chance to win a national championship. Now, he is playing well enough to where even if JT Daniels is cleared to go, especially with the added mobility factor that Stetson Bennett gives you and the overall makeup of this team, he's the better option. And therein lies the problem, because that's not true. He is the better option right now, obviously, because JT Daniels hasn't been cleared. And the predicament Georgia football will find itself in is Stetson Bennett, fortunately slash unfortunately, is plenty good enough for Georgia to steamroll pretty much everyone they play. If they show up with a B-plus caliber game or better, they are good enough to run the table in the regular season. That's the good news. The bad news is that ain't the goal. And so eventually down the road, I know Georgia folks are tired of hearing this, someone's going to score on you. May not be 35, but someone's going to score on you. And in order to get where you want to be, which as far as I can tell is not merely Atlanta, but you want to get all the way to <laughs> Indianapolis, can you believe we're saying that? We're not, going to meet, we're not going to visit Steve Wolfong either. We're going to Indianapolis to crown a college football champion. But having said that, they don't let me pick the locations or we wouldn't have been in Santa Clara a few years ago, believe me. In order to get there, there's going to be a stretch eventually for Georgia, probably starting in Atlanta, where you have to face two or three teams that can stretch the field vertically, that have plus to elite balance offensively, and can strain your defense in ways that it hasn't been strained so far. Again, Georgia's got the best defense in the country. It is not impenetrable. So what does that mean? What it means is it seems unfathomable right now that you could turn on the TV Saturday against Kentucky and Georgia could be down 14-3. to Unfathomable. For the record, I agree with that. That's pretty unfathomable. It's possible against Oklahoma. It's possible against Alabama. It's possible against Ohio State. You feel totally comfortable with Stetson Bennett in the prior role. What about the role that I just presented? What about that scenario? What if that were to crop up? It's possible down the stretch. We're not talking about certainties. We're talking about possibilities. And the fact of the matter is, as far as I'm concerned, Stetson Bennett has been the right guy for the job. Context is king here. Please hear what I'm saying. I ain't telling you he's a bad dude. I'm not telling you he's a bad player. I'm telling you he's been a very, very serviceable, very, very good player for them. And he's good enough to do everything you need to do in the regular season. If you want to win a national championship, I'm telling you there are qualities that JT Daniels possesses in his game that give you a better chance to reach the top of the mountain than Stetson Bennett will give you. That cannot be seen right now. You cannot see the cracks in the dam unless you're really close until the water pressure gets applied. There are a few cracks in Georgia's dam. There are cracks in every dam in this sport. They have not had the water pressure applied yet. And so it is sacrilege to speak ill of anyone. On that roster and on that team right now, I get it because I talk to you guys every single day. But it's there. Now, they could still win a title for all I know, even with Stetson Bennett. I'm telling you, the biggest vulnerability 
lies in that portion of the team. What about Ohio State? Defensive concerns have not evaporated with this team. Believe me, we knew even in August when we looked at a Big Ten helmet grid schedule, we knew there was a little bit of jelly inside the middle of that Ohio State schedule. And they're right smack dab in the middle. It's been really sweet, hasn't it? Because you've gotten really fat on it. And therefore, when you made the coaching changes on the defensive side of the ball and then you see the results against inferior competition, sometimes it can lead you to believe that permanent changes have been made and all the wrongs have been righted. Now, most Buckeye fans do not believe this. They know there's coming a time down the stretch where it'll pop up again. They just hope they've improved enough defensively. And I hope you have too. My biggest question is whether you have. Uh, there are some numbers, like they're 110th in the country in plays given up of 10 yards or more. You're just not facing a lot of teams right now that are capable really of exposing that, but you're looking at the remainder of their schedule. If you're watching on YouTube right now, uh, they play at Indiana coming up after the bye. Then they got Penn State coming in. Anyone, I'll give you $5 if you tell me who's going to start for quarterback at, uh, at Penn State at that game. But they play Nebraska, Purdue. I know what you're thinking to yourself. You're thinking, when are these games going to come? Well, we're talking about making it all the way. So if it doesn't happen in Big Ten play, if it doesn't happen in Indianapolis, it'll happen in the playoff. They will face that pushback in the playoff. And they will face a quarterback and a, a receiving core that can throw on them and run on them in the playoff. So those are the Big Ten Eastern Division standings right now. Uh, for the record, talk to an odds-making buddy. I told you this the other night. I just forget what all I told you because uh, the throat went berserk eventually. Ohio State would be at least a touchdown to an eight-point favorite over everyone else in the Big Ten right now. So I know they're not ranked ahead of everyone, but we have them power rated ahead of everyone for that reason. So moving forward, regardless of what happened against Oregon, that's how odds makers see it. But then again, Ohio State's been favored in games before that they've lost. So that's not a certainty. That just lets you know the lay of the land right now. Uh, what about Iowa? Let's stay in the Big Ten. Uh, this is obvious now. The biggest vulnerability is obvious. It's been the offense. They have made that irrelevant thus far because they have played the most complimentary style of football in America. I don't think any team in America is more perfectly in tune and at peace with the identity of their program and of their team than Iowa. Does it eventually run out? And we're not talking about over the span of four or five games. We're talking about going the distance here. And go, go the distance. Going the distance here, James Earl Jones. Going the distance here would mean that you have to ride a wave of defensive points, special teams, shining and turnovers and whatnot the entirety of the season. That's hard to do even on Xbox. Pretty much impossible to do in uh, real life. 121st in yards per play. That is the Iowa offense. They are the currently, as they stand right now. So let me give you a little stat, Chris Hummer. I believe, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to do this. You don't ever want to improperly attribute, period. But you especially don't want to do it when it is your own company. Oh, the article's gone. Listen, there's like a 70% chance Chris Hummer wrote this article. And if he didn't, he'll write something good before the end of the week. And I will update you on who wrote this wonderful article. But it uh, was on 247sports.com when I started the show. Whomstever wrote that article came up with the following stat. The worst ever yards per... Or, um, yeah, yards per play in the college football playoff. So I'm going to reset that because I butchered it. They didn't. Yards per play. It's a metric a lot of people follow. The worst ever team in that category to make the playoff was Michigan State in 2015. They were 81st. Currently, Iowa is 121. Crazier things have happened. Just giving you a little frame of reference there. Cincinnati, twofold here are the vulnerabilities, at least the biggest that I think face the Bearcats. The first is very, very general. It's just the weight of November. November weighs a whole lot. That's why a lot of teams crumple under the weight of it. And especially if you have not dealt with expectation that deep into a season. The football season is so long. When you're a fan and you're watching it, you find yourself saying, boy, this season flew by. You notice how no players ever say that? You notice how no coaches ever say, Boy, this season's really flying by. And if they do, those words are said way before November. Uh-uh. November lasts like 19 weeks, it feels like, especially if you have a single-digit number next to your name, meaning the expectations are out of this world, and it's like a tightrope walk on a 50-story building. You cannot slip, or else your street pizza. And your hopes and dreams are splattered all over the pavement. Very graphic, but I think necessary for the point I'm trying to make here. So that's the first thing. 
They're just dealing with expectation they've never dealt with before. The second thing is that offense at Cincinnati has been good, but it's been good in spurts. Therefore, it's also had a tendency to have a drought period every now and then. Uh, also, third down and red zone. Third down numbers here. They are 74th in third down efficiency. Not anything to write home about. And they're 70th in red zone scoring. And that is uh, at least partially due to a subpar kicking game there. So that's the kind of stuff that can bite you. I'll give you an example. We're not even talking about them this weekend. They play, I want to say, Central Florida. That may be a Friday night game. Regardless, they play Central Florida Saturday or, or this week. They're a 21-point favorite. I, it, are we paying attention to it? No, we're not really paying attention to it. But that's the kind of game, because Cincinnati does not have this, this Georgia versus Kentucky talent edge. They're a better team. And you've had, obviously, quarterback situations and whatnot at, at Central Florida. But on any given Thursday or Friday or Saturday, this is not the kind of team that can just roll its helmet out there. It's not the kind of conference where that happens. Keep an eye on every single game. For that matter, keep an eye on Iowa versus Purdue. When you're getting by in the manner in which Iowa's getting by, and you're in the 120s total offense, everyone on your schedule virtually can beat you. Now, you could also suffocate everyone on your schedule. A lot of variance in these games right now. What about Oklahoma? They're allowing too many explosive pass plays. That's what about Oklahoma. And obviously, that's going to continue more and more as the games get bigger. They're 111th in explosive plays allowed in the air. Yeah, 111. So you want to get to the mountaintop, you're going to face some teams that can throw the ball on you. It takes a certain level of speed out wide, though, to really magnify that. And that's why against certain teams, you're probably going to see Oklahoma put a really good defensive product on the field. I'm not talking about that. We're not talking about winning the Big 12 and winning the Big 12 alone. Xavier Worthy went off against Oklahoma last week. That's because he can run by everyone in the secondary. So can Jamison Williams at Alabama. So can a couple of them they have at Ohio State. And so that's the kind of stuff you got to get ready for. You're looking at the remainder of Oklahoma's schedule. They are favored, as they should be, the rest of the way. Do you see any receiver combos that terrify you? I think Texas Tech's an interesting matchup. But I really don't think that Oklahoma is going to have nearly as much to worry about on the back end of this schedule you're looking at, if you're watching on YouTube, as they potentially would, not even in the Big 12 championship game, as much as first round of playoff or national championship. And the last one's Alabama. And you have fresh in your mind the loss that they incurred to Texas A&M. To me, the biggest vulnerability with Alabama is overall caliber of defense. That, combined with the fact that this offense, although it's been good, it does not have the blanket bailout ability that it had last year. Think about the Ole Miss game last year. It was a nightmare defensively. They gave up 48 points. It didn't matter because they scored 62 or 63. This offense this year is good, but it's obviously off a tick or two from last year, as will pretty much every offense you see in America. And so I've told you before, I think schematically, now I don't know to what degree we'll see this, I think you'll see some changes. That's as far as I'm going, because if you ask me which ones, I don't necessarily know. What I do know is there's no way Nick Saban and Pete Golding watched the game film against A&M and said, all right, yeah, certainly, that's what we want to do moving forward. Just didn't work out for us. There were too many times that their players were put in positions where they couldn't make plays. Our, our buddies, uh, college football nerds, actually, they, they post on a lot of the 24-7 boards. Now, I think it may have been... You know, I don't even know which one of them it was, to be honest with you. Siamese twins, as far as I'm concerned. But they were talking about situations, for instance, trying to cover a running back out of the backfield, where you task an outside linebacker with that, and trying to run through traffic uh, before you even catch up with a guy equal to or faster than you. It was a non-starter, the point is. When you watch that A&M Alabama game, there are guys from the moment the ball snapped that you have no shot of covering, given schematically how you planned on coverage in that play. So I'm saying all that to say, I think you'll see some schematic changes, but personnel changes is what I'm interested in. And I don't know that it happens if you're looking at the schedule here. I don't know if it happens Saturday at Mississippi State. I don't know if it happens against Tennessee last week. So many of you pointed out my inaccuracy the other night. No, they don't have a bye after this week. They got a bye after the Tennessee game. So yes, it's not actually, it's not exactly the easiest defensive challenge to just hop and skip over the Tennessee passing game right now. Then they'll have a bye. What I'm saying is, I wonder how many kids that we're not regularly seeing in the rotation now that we will see? Not even specifying a position. Wide receiver could be that. Right tackle could be that. Um, 
Uh, secondary could be that. I don't know. So we'll see. But those are vulnerabilities. They're relative, as I said, with all these teams because these are very, very good teams.